Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome to another Barnegat Bay Book Club. I could swear it was yesterday when we did the last one. Um, the time is flying. So thank you for being here in the Zoom room. Um, if you are here with us, uh, you can drop things in the chat or since we're such a small group tonight, you can just unmute yourself if you have questions. Uh, if you're here on Facebook, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, you can drop comments in the comment section below the video so that we can monitor them and, and uh, present them to our speaker. So um, I, uh, my name is Grace Ann Taylor. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Save Barnegat Bay. And live tonight, we have um, Carlton Montgomery, who's the Executive Director of Pinelands Preservation Alliance. And we changed things up a little bit this month. So uh, we read John McPhee's book, um, the Pine Barrens. So uh, this book was published in 1967 um, and that, or copyrighted in 67 and uh, published in 68. So it is a little bit older, um, but we decided uh, to host Carlton Montgomery, who's the executive director of PPA, to celebrate this book and to celebrate the Pine Barrens and the story of how this book um, came about and changed the outcome of the land that we value so much. And hopefully, by the end of it, you'll understand the connection from the Pine Barrens to Barnegat Bay and some things that we can all do to get involved to help protect both the Pine Barrens and the Bay uh, because they are connected and there is so much that um, goes on between both ecosystems. They might seem like different places, but um, they are very much intertwined. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. So Carlton, like I said, is, ex is the executive director of PPA. Um, and he comes to us from a background in legal work in DC and has come over to the environmental work um, in the nonprofit world. Uh, so Carlton has a degree in, um, from Harvard and uh, from the University of, uni from University College London, both in philosophy and uh, JD from Harvard Law School. So there's a whole lot of credentials there. Um, he's the editor of a regional planning of sustainable America, how creative programs are promoting prosperity and saving the environment, which was published at Rutgers University. So you can actually check out his book. Um, and, uh, it's a book he compiled in which he contributed to the introductory and, um, concluding chapters. So, uh, you can read more about all of that good stuff at, uh, Pinelands Preservation Alliance's website. And uh, without further ado, what we'll do is we'll have Carlton speak. And then if you have questions, like I said, you can pose them uh, or unmute yourself as need be. You can raise your hand in the Zoom uh, room. So thank you so much for being here, Carlton, to honor the book um, that John wrote. Uh, take it away. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me and including me in your conversation. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about why this book, uh, The Pine Barrens by John McPhee, is so important to me because the Pinelands is important to me and this book really played an extraordinary role in bringing us to where we are today where 1.1 million acres of New Jersey nearly a quarter of the state has special and extraordinarily powerful land use controls um, that override uh, municipal zoning municipal zoning has to be consistent with the regional plan, with this regional vision, which is based on the premise that by controlling development, allowing it in some places, but then drawing boundaries and saying, you know, you can't build over there, the state could protect this unique ecosystem and its extraordinary resources of soils, water, plants, and wildlife. Even in the nation's most crowded, most heavily developed, developed state of New Jersey. So think back to 19, the mid 1960s. John McPhee was a young man then. Um, he had written, um, started writing for the New Yorker magazine and had published a couple of well-regarded books of uh, nonfiction. Um, and he was looking for a new project purely by chance a friend said you know you should go down and check out the pine barrens in south jersey which he was wholly unaware of even though he 
lived in the Princeton area. And so he said, okay, I'll try it. And he had a VW bug and he went down and ended up uh, becoming absolutely um, enchanted by the place, spent um, a good more than a year researching the book, writing it, and then publishing it as a series, first in the New Yorker and then as a book. And the book, um, you know, it, it tells the story of the Pine Barrens through the stories of people, through the eyes of people who uh, lived, some of them still live, um, and uh, in the Pine Barrens, and represented different aspects of the place. But in the course of this, he tells the story of its um, extraordinary ecology and its um, extraordinary value as a natural resource, the kind of place that if you lose it here, you're not going to find it anywhere else on Earth. But at the end of the book, he's talking about the various plans to develop the Pine Barrens. By this time, after pretty intensive colonial exploitation of forests um, throughout South Jersey, much of the forest had regrown because the soil being sandy and acidic and very droughty wasn't very good for upland crops. It wasn't a great place to grow tomatoes. So much of the forest had been allowed to recover and the resources that people exploited in the Pine Barrens were found in more abundance in the you know, 18th and 19th centuries to the West and the South. So the Pine Barrens was kind of left, you know, left behind by modern industry. Um, and in the middle of the uh, 20th century, um, much forest still survived with towns, villages, some farming, some cranberry growing, some blueberry growing scattered throughout the region, but vast stretches of forest. And um, naturally, this would become a target for all kinds of ambitions to develop over time. And he talks about this. And then um, at the very end, on page 156, he says uh, about the debate of protection versus development. He says, given the futilities of that debate, given the sort of attention that is ordinarily paid to plans put forward by conservationists, and given the great numbers and cross purposes of all the big and little powers that would have to work together to accomplish anything on a major scale in the pines, it would appear that the Pine Barrens are not very likely to be the subject of dramatic decrees or acts of legislation. They seem to be heading slowly toward extinction. In retrospect, people may one day look back upon the final stages of the development of the great unbroken Eastern city and be able to say at what moment all remaining undeveloped land should have been considered no longer a potential asset to individuals, but an asset to the society at large, perhaps a social necessity. Well, that's a pretty um, downbeat assessment that he wrote in 1966 and 1967 when the book was published. It happened to be that people were working you know, to try to get protection for the Pinelands over the, the 60s and into the 70s. And then Brendan Byrne got elected governor in the late 70s. He was friends with John McPhee's brother and became friends with McPhee because McPhee was living in Princeton. The, uh, the, the gubernatorial mansion at that time was um, uh, Morvan House you know, right near the university. They both played tennis, and there was a grass tennis court at, in the back of Morvan where they would play tennis together. And um, people who were bringing the Pinelands, you know, the issue of protecting the Pine Barrens to Governor Byrne, and he read John's book. And he, he, they both say this story is true. One day over tennis, Byrne says to John McPhee, you know, John, I'm going to prove you wrong about that, the end of your book. He said, I take this as a personal challenge and we're going to save this place. Maybe he would have done it if he hadn't been friends with John McPhee and read the book. Who knows? 
But it was clear that this book captured his imagination just as it can capture ours. And although a lot of people had to contribute to creating the Pinelands Protection Laws, it never would have happened if Brendan Byrne had not been governor at that moment in time. Because as McPhee points out, it's almost impossible to imagine our society getting itself organized enough to do something as out of step with the way we manage land as creating the Pine Lands National Reserve and imposing these really stringent development laws. So I think this book did play a role in motivating Governor Byrne to overcome all of the resistance, all of the opposition, and basically force the adoption of a set of laws that are truly the most powerful land use controls in America. And, you know, begin this experiment that now, 40 years later, is demonstrably successful. Now, my organization, Pinelands Preservation Alliance and Save Barnegat Bay, and our other partners like the Sierra Club and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation and the American Literal Society, um, the Audubon Society, I can't name them all right here. We all you know, work every day because there are people who are trying to undermine that system of protections, but they have failed. As of today, they have failed over 40 years to do that. Um, and this, uh, program has given us today in the pine within the Pinelands boundary within the 1.1 million acres that have uh, the protections of the Pinelands Protection Act there is about 800,000 acres of forest and this isn't like you know a municipal park or a subdivision that has trees actual forest um, and that's in incredible in New Jersey you know a small densely populated, densely developed state. Um, it really is um, the largest surviving open space between the northern forests of Maine and, you know, perhaps the evergreens might count along the eastern seaboard. There's really nothing like it. Um, and, it's, and it's based on a creative idea that we're not just gonna to try to create a national park, which would have ended up being much smaller than the Pinelands, but instead we're gonna combine public land purchases with regulatory measures, put them together. We're gonna to provide for growth and development, mostly around the edges or in pre-existing towns, um, but we're going to say across this boundary, you know, you really can't do any development of these woods. Um, and you know, the system is not perfect. There are many things that we have learned in the last 40 years about how better to protect nature. But when you look at what it has accomplished um, in preventing sprawl, penetrating these forested areas and promoting the um, purchase of hundreds of thousands of acres of forest in those years, um, it is a um, it's a slam dunk dump success. It's a it's a great success, and something that all of us should be really proud of. So I think what what I love about this book is, like I say, first it played a big role in bringing this extraordinary achievement about, and today people continue to read it, like all of you. Um, uh, I am sure this is the book of John McPhee's many many books that is most has been most read. I, I, I feel more really sure of that. I don't actually have statistics, but partly because um, it, it, you know, it, its beauty is that it is, it is so readable. It is so, um, the people are painted in such a, a beautifully sympathetic fashion and the landscape is captured. And this landscape is still here. Some of the people are no longer with us. There's more suburbs now than there was when it was written. There are more natural gas pipelines now than when it was written. 
but it is still the case that you can read this book and go out and see all of these places and experience them just as John McPhee did, um, in part because he wrote this book. That's pretty magical. <laughs> So oh, I, I hope that um, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, activism, because uh, what was done 40 years ago will only survive if we stay involved in it. And, you know, that's, that's how Britta and Willie and I have gotten to know one another. It's over fighting to make the system work. Um, but I also would really love to hear what people's thoughts are about the Pinelands and about uh, their reactions to the book. So one of the things we have going on here is we have a, um, you know, we have everyone on a Zoom, instead of a webinar version, we have it in a Zoom call so that everyone can participate. So you're muted automatically as a participant in the Zoom call, but if you'd like to unmute and share your thoughts about uh, the book, if you read it, um, we would love to invite you to do that now. Um, and if you're in Facebook land, we can take your comments and I will read them aloud for you. Or if you just have general questions about the pines, I think, you know, you haven't had a chance to read the book, but maybe you're thinking of it and you're interested in the subject and you have questions. I think Willie's holding his finger up. I, I just saw so many sort of connections in the book. The book, I mean, Carl, Carlton mentioned how he weaves uh, the ecological factors into its description of the people. You know, it's, the book is like a fabric, really. But it's also a brilliant example of a, a sort of a group of books, 19, six, books written in the 1960s that changed the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, um, Unsafe at Any Speed by Ralph Nader, was a book changing world. Uh, a, world-changing book. Um, uh, the Feminine Mystique, it's written in the 1960s by Betty Friedan. And, and uh, others that aren't jumping to my mind, but they're, they're there, you know, in, important books. And so there is something, a lot in the air, as we all know, in the 1960s, and sometimes people disparage it, but it's really sort of an interesting uh, sort of peak of successful intellectual uh, advocacy. And it, it, I just found it really interesting as an example of that, albeit more regional. And, and another thing that hit me as you were talking, Carlton, is the tennis game between, or involving John McPhee and Brendan Byrne. It really strikes a parallel to how Island Beach State Park was saved according to legend and fact. They were gonna, they were gonna split the baby in half as so often happens in, in proposals to save anything. And they were gonna save the bottom half and then make a giant development of the whole Northern half of Island Beach. But somebody's wife played bridge once a week with Governor Driscoll's wife and that's how they save the park through that. And, and so it's, a, it's in a way a political science lesson that um, personal connections mean a lot. There's no question in there, it's just sort of re re reactions. Thank you for that, Willie. Um, and uh, so Jan Larson is here with us and um, she's uh, commenting and, and actually Carlton, you might, have work that PPA is doing that, you know, I, you know, we're just unaware of, but she's asking, how do we get students to read these books, um, especially the ones that Willie was mentioning? Is there any uh, outreach efforts happening to engage youth on these, on the subject of the Pine Barrens over at your organization? Uh, yeah, there is. Um, and most of that we do now through our Pinelands Adventures program. Several years ago, we set up a canoe and kayak livery and guided nature trip outfit called Pinelands Adventures, um, headquartered at At Zion Lake um, in Wharton State Forest. And um, 
before the pandemic, <laughs> we were doing a lot of youth trips, guided trips with uh, youngsters through schools and community service organizations and even county, county uh, social service programs. Um, those came to a halt and we're going to have to try to rebuild those next year. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Uh, all of that effort is premised on the idea that people are going to, whatever their age, they're going to get interested and they're going to be attached to a place if they experience it. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a canoe trip is worth at least a thousand pictures, if not more, in making you think this is really cool. Um, and it can be, you know, so much fun um, at the same time that you're learning something about the world. So that's where we've put most of our of our efforts. And I, you know, about about reading, it, it takes teachers, right? Um, and uh, there are so many wonderful teachers out there. Um, the challenge for organizations like ours is reaching those that are interested and giving them the tools, um, helping them have the tools to bring that learning to their classroom, including assigning a book like the Pine Barrens, which is, you know, perfectly suitable for middle school through high school ages. Um, and so we also have a teacher training institute every summer, every June, um, that is free uh, to teachers um, to try to give them uh, the background and uh, some of the experiences in the field to, to do that. Um, you know, I think that it is something we have to keep doing, um, not losing track of young people as we appeal to, you know, those uh, adults who are, uh, um, you know, the the most engaged typically in in the work we do, um, because uh, they're getting older. We're getting older. But like we said earlier, with age comes wisdom. <laughs> So we just have to figure out how to get all the wisdom from the older generations down to the younger generations. <laughs> I was gonna say that, um, speaking of wisdom, this year we lost Candy Ashman, um, who was a legend at the Pinelands Commission and um, a force to contend with on environmental rules in the state, uh, such a significant loss. Um, and I know that you have a campaign going on right now uh, to get new commissioners seated at the Pinelands Commission. Maybe you could talk about that for a minute. And I'll just mention a shout out to a dear colleague to many of us on the call here, Teresa Lettman, um, who is a champion for the Pines and would make a great representative from Ocean County. Um, and if there's something we could do to help you, um, maybe you can talk about that a little bit, Carl. Sure. Well, so, um... At the heart of the Pinelands Protection Laws is a special state agency called the Pinelands Commission that wrote and enforces and promulgates changes the rules over development. Um, and that agency is really important because of the power that they have. Um, and traditionally, it's been a, a mix of people but always a majority at least who really believed in the mission of the Pinelands protection. So the, the commission is made up of uh, 15 members in theory, seven who are nominated by the governor of the day and are confirmed by, but have to be confirmed by the state Senate. Uh, seven come, one from each of the seven counties that has land in the Pinelands. And then one person is to be the designee of the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, which shows there's a continuing federal partnership in the effort. But in recent years, the Pinelands Commission has really become uh, paralyzed and frankly debased in its work. Um, this was unfortunately the result of um, controversies over the natural gas pipelines leading the governor and Senate President Stephen Sweeney to kind of pack the commission with people who would approve those pipelines. Um, and then since that, once that was done, you know, people began to fall away. And then we had, uh, we lost Candy Ashman who passed away. Um, 
Governor Murphy has made excellent nominations that have been pending for two years, but the Senate president has not allowed them to come to the Senate vote for confirmation. So one of our major campaigns at the moment is to try to persuade Senator Sweeney to just, you know, let it happen. <laughs> the pipeline issues are done as far as the Pinelands Commission is concerned. It's time to move on and let the commission do its job uh, because right now it's not doing anything. It's not addressing the issues that are facing the Pinelands, starting with climate change, with um, people who do terrible damage to public land through illegal off-roading and dumping, um, and uh, excessive use of our water supplies. I don't know if you're seeing it much um, in the Barnegat Bay area, but where I am in Medford, in Burlington County, the building boom has started again. There are houses going up in the Pinelands here in areas where they're permitted to be built, but they draw on all sorts of resources, including water. And that water comes from the ground. It comes from the aquifers. And one of the biggest issues, long-term issues that the Pinelands Commission needs to deal with is excessive exploitation of our aquifers. Really important, you know, it gets more and more important as you go east <laughs> because you don't have access to uh, the Delaware River water supply. Um, so all those things need to happen. And it would be great if people haven't done so already to, uh, um, weigh in with Senator Sweeney and ask him nicely to, uh, you know, get it done, do his job, let these things go forward. On our website uh, at pinelandsalliance.org, under getting involved or taking action, you'll see there's information about this topic and ways, uh, information about how you can get involved in doing it. We have a very strange system in New Jersey where the Senate president, although elected only by, you know, one district in the state, has about as much power as the governor, who is elected by everybody. And the Senate president can completely prevent the legislature from doing anything if he or she wants it so. And unfortunately, that's where we've been with Pinelands issues for the last couple of years. Carlton, I know that uh, Teresa Letman uh, worked for you for a long time, and I remember working with her a lot, which was fun uh, and effective. Who, who are the other nominees? Right, so uh, Teresa um, uh, from Manchester um, is nominated to fill the position that Candace Ashman, that Candy Ashman, um... oh, there you go, there's Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> There's Teresa. Um, uh, she's nominated for the position that Candy Ashman uh, has vacated um, when she died. Then um, Jennifer Coffey, who is in the upper left on my screen. Uh, she's the executive director of the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, a terrific environmentalist. Uh, next to her, the uh, man on the right, not him, yep. <laughs> The man on the left is your Ocean County designate, Avery. Avery. Um, the man on the right is Bob Jackson from, from Cape May County, who was on the Pinelands Commission, um, a terrific member of the commission, and um, over the South Jersey gas pipeline proposal a few years ago, um, uh, Governor Christie uh, and, and, and uh, Stephen Sweeney um, replaced him with someone who would vote for the pipeline. And now he's nominated to come back onto the commission. He would be the only person of color on the commission uh, if he were to be, uh, you know, to be confirmed. In the lower left is Ed Lloyd, who is a current member of the commission, and he's up for having his term renewed. He's one of the uh, most important environmental lawyers in New Jersey. Um, and uh, an expert on all things to do with environmental law. And then next to him, is the, the woman there is Jessica Sanchez, um, former water supply analyst with the Delaware River Basin Commission, now retired, um, and she's also nominated for the commission. Um, and then Teresa to the right was, um, she worked for Pinelands Preservation Alliance for 20 plus years and was just the heart and soul of the organization before she retired. 
and would be a phenomenal member of the Pinelands Commission. All of these great are really great choices. Uh, yeah, that is a spectacular suite of choices. Um, uh, can you explain the system where if someone is boot is not renominated, they, they continue to function, right? That's a little complicated. So where does that put us? Well, a number, so this is one of the bodies that's fairly typical in New Jersey for these kinds of um, independent executive agencies that have a governing board, like a port authority, for example. You're, you're appointed for a three-year term, but you serve until you're replaced. Because if they didn't do that, these agencies couldn't function at all. Mm -hmm. Because governors and senators have such a terrible time getting anybody confirmed onto agencies. In addition to giving the Senate president extraordinary power, the Senate has another terrible rule, which allows senators to blackball without explanation anyone who is nominated for any kind of position, whether it's a judgeship or a Pinelands Commission or a Port Authority, um, who lives in their district. Right, senatorial courtesy. It's a ridiculous system. It just leads to all kinds of arbitrary log rolling and you know bad political deal making, um, and it gives um, you know individual senators the capacity to paralyze government for for no good reason. Um, and that has happened frequently in the course of the Pinelands Commission history. So if people could not continue to serve after the three-year term, we'd end up with nobody on these agencies because our political system is so broken that it can't function properly to fill important government functions. That's so true. I think um, I didn't want to not mention one of our uh, longtime board members, no longer on our board, but Darcy Rohan Green. Yeah. Currently on the commission and voted against the Pinelands, uh, the pipe, Pipeline. It was like, it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't there that day, but Willie was. <laughs> it was very dramatic. It was very dramatic. Yeah. I just. Oh, uh, oh go ahead, Britta. I just going to agree that this is just a fantastic group of individuals. Um, it's hard to believe that this current political environment, we can't get these folks uh, through the appointments. It's just, it's it's beyond uh, dysfunctional, as you said, Carlton. I know there's a lot of other agencies that are being held up, but it just seems like this one is just so critical. And, and really, you know, anything that anyone who's on, on the Zoom or on Facebook, if you can participate in this campaign and write a letter, make a phone call, send an email, uh, would really be appreciated. So for those of you who want to get involved, uh, mm -hmm. we always like to make sure that's very easy to do. So I placed the link to the uh, pinelandsalliance.org slash take action um, link in the chat, both on Facebook and on Zoom. So you should see that very at the bottom. I don't think anyone said anything since then. Uh, and so just to kind of go over some of the things you can do, uh, is specifically we need to ask uh, Sweeney to put this um, at the top of his priorities. So you can call, um, did I highlight the right thing here? Yeah, um, you can call him and then also writing a letter. Uh, the nice thing is that they already um, made a nice outline for you to do that. So you don't even really have to do too much thinking. Um, you can sign up via this form and uh, get involved that way. And let's see, what else? Um, do you wanna go, you can, of course, if you know maybe you did your part, you wrote your letter, or maybe for some reason or another, you don't feel comfortable doing so, you can still raise awareness for this campaign by tagging uh, all of the social media sites. And of course, tag Pinelands Alliance throughout all of that so that you we can raise awareness that this issue exists. Um, and um, because we need we need really good individuals to vote against bigger issues. So there might not be something really hot and heavy right now. Um, and there probably is, frankly, if, <laughs> that I just, you know, I've, I know all of Britta's um, things, but I don't know all Carlton's battles, right? Um, so uh, 
So there's probably something going on, but you know, we really need these people to be seated so that when something does come up, we have good advocates who mean, who are um, knowledgeable and passionate about the issues that they can speak on them and, and be a voice for the Pinelands. We always say at Save Barnegat Bay that we are a voice for Barnegat Bay because advocacy sometimes is a weird word for people to, to interpret. They feel sometimes like advocacy means that um, you know, we're getting involved in things we shouldn't, or I, I don't know, it's just a word with a bad taste in people's mouths. Um, but really, we are just a voice for Barnegat Bay, and the Pinelands Alliance and also the Commission are a voice for the Pine Barrens. They are speaking on behalf of that ecosystem and, and everything that's there. Um, so uh, we had also, I just want to mention Keith Muller, he's watching on Facebook. Thank you, Keith. Um, he's commenting uh, a program called Lines on the Pines that's hosted all the, um, each year. I've never been, um, but it's hosted in March. So hopefully this year with any luck, we'll be able to host it. Uh, it's at Stockton University um, and it's got activities for kids and families. I've heard good things about it. I've just never been myself. Do you wanna speak on that? Well, it is a great, it's a great program that um, has been going on for some years that highlights all of the people who are writing uh, about the Pinelands in one way or another, whether it's ecology or culture or folklore. Um, and uh, that's why it's called Lines on the Pines. So it's a lot of fun and you're bound to find something there you didn't know you didn't know about before you went in. So there's a whole website about it. I'll put it in the chat and on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> we also uh, have been talking with um, some other folks, uh, Jason, about showing the movie that was made about the off-road vehicles, you know, and the damage and destruction, the pines. The pine I, mud, it's called, yeah. And yeah, and we, uh, built an outdoor classroom, Carlton, that I think you'd really like. It's um, called the River Time. It's at our eco center in Tom's River. Oh. And it's like an outdoor amphitheater with benches. And we do have a movie screen and projector. And so we would like to uh, show the movie, but also host a conversation uh, after the movie so that we could better understand um, what the issues are. I'm feeling that you know, within our envelope in Ocean County, we have a lot of people who do enjoy off-road vehicle um, things on the weekends and what have you. So our the conversation might be one that is truly engaging with not just the environmental community, but folks who uh, maybe don't understand the impacts that they're having with their recreational activities. We, um, we worry about the term off-roading because it's ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Some people mean off of a paved road. Mm -hmm. And I love to drive off of a paved road on a sand road. For some people, it means driving off of the road altogether into a, you know, into a wind or a stream or um, some other place where you're not supposed to drive and where you can tear up the, uh, you know, obviously you will you tear up the, the ecosystem. And so I always like to make sure, make it clear what we're talking about when we we worry about this stuff is illegal off-roading, um, driving where uh, you shouldn't, um, and mudding, tearing, even tearing roads up by spinning your wheels so other people cannot safely use those roads. Those are the issues we're talking about, and I think the pine mud film is a really good place to uh, to sort of learn about the depredations that can come from people being irresponsible. Yeah, so I think we're we're looking for maybe the spring, you know, a little bit. Hopefully, we're coming out of COVID a little bit, and we can do an outside program. Would be nice. Yeah, we, we've also not wanted to show the film until people can safely be together. Right. So we think about uh, the meaning of words all the time. It's 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 important to us, and you know, just what words successfully communicate our cause. And that's really interesting what you have to say. Uh, it, it attracts our attention, you know, off-road vehicles or, and what is off-road. So um, 
I mean, causes succeed and fail on things like that. Whether you've made the right choice of words to communicate your, your, your meaning and is mudding the new, have, have you focus grouped uh, a new phrase or a new word? Is there, is there one that we sh should we be using a different vocabulary rather than just specific, but rather than calling it illegal? Because if you say illegal off-roading, that gets under a lot of people's skin too. They don't want to hear, oh my God, something else is illegal now. Um, so this sounds like a word search. We should get Frank Luntz or somebody to come in and do a focus group for us. You're probably right. I think that um, this is certainly a topic where people can draw battle lines before they really understand what they're each talking about. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that many times. We like to pride ourselves, Carlton, that we often say we're a big tent with a loud family uh, because we have so many varied opinions and voices in our organization. And we like that. And we try to encourage people to say what's on their minds. So that's why I was feeling, you know, if we show the movie, we need to make space for conversation similar to this. We like to have an open family setting. Doesn't mean we're going to get along always on everything, right? Um, but hopefully we can each grow from each other and learn something. Uh, Jan Larson's put a message, by the way, in the asking Carlton what the status of legal alternative off-roading facilities. I don't know if you... Um. I don't think anybody is actively trying to pursue another one. Um, there is there is a facility in um, Vineland that is um, available, uh, but other attempts to create basically off-road parks, off ORV parks, have generally failed because um, in order to do it legally, you've got to have both a big piece of land and um, admission fee to take care of the land and buy insurance and deal with all of those things. It's a, it's a dangerous sport. You know, every year and increasingly, according to the state forest managers, um, people are getting killed on these things uh, in motorcycle and ATV accidents, typically. Um, so insurance is a big issue. The result is that when parks have been created, people haven't used them. And one reason they haven't used them is why go and pay someone to be in one place when you can go anywhere <laughs> with, with, with impunity mm -hmm. um, and, and do the same kind of activities. So they have not been successful so far. And I don't think, I think evidence here and in other states has shown that the existence of a lawful facility does not prevent people from going into state, into public lands um, and doing activities that, you know, are prohibited in order to protect the, the resource, the ecosystem. All right, especially if there's little to no enforcement in those spaces. Correct, right. And, you know, it, interesting what you talk about the, you know, the battle lines and, and the terminology. One of the things that we have done this year, it's actually now uh, a year ago, we reached an agreement on a statement of principles with, uh, between uh, PPA, New Jersey Conservation Foundation, and the East Coast Enduro Association. Oh. Enduros are large motorcycle uh, events. They're, they're tournaments. They're not based on speed races. They're based on being able to complete their time trials, I guess you would say, um, on complex routes. But mostly it's about being able to find your way without knowing the route ahead of time. And it's, it's a big sport. Um, it, a number of enduro events are held each year in the Pinelands. And they have a professional, they have a, a, um, an industry association, the East Coast Enduro Association. And we, you know, we were able to get together and sort of putting aside presumptions about one another and reach a common understanding that their sport is compatible with protecting the Pinelands. Mm -hmm. And they agree that people should not be driving off of roads into wetlands and tearing up ponds and streams. That's, they agree with that. That's the bad thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we came to a joint agreement um, when we had actually been adversaries before because we sat down and talked to one another. Great. We then presented these principles to the Department of Environmental Protection, 
which us to get together. And what have they done in the years since we presented those proposals? Can you guess how much they've done? Very little to nothing. Very little to nothing. Exactly. Well, but um, it shows. I think there there is far more common ground about what is appropriate recreation on public lands than would appear from some of the arguments that have arisen in the past. I think I love that, Carlton, and especially, you know, in a piece of work that we've been doing, working with the Ocean County Sheriff's Department to try to uh, get some funds and support for their staffing to educate boaters and jet ski users about, you know, getting too close to the environmentally sensitive areas in the bay. And the focus is on education, following up with enforcement. And um, I think you know this, we had a conference on Barnegat Bay last year in October. We had three days with target audiences, the first one being law enforcement. We got a lot of uh, questions from folks about that. You know, what is that doing on an environmental conference? But essentially the law enforcement community needs a lot of our support, right? Both financially and programmatically. Did we lose you, Carlton? Are you still there? Here. Yeah. Oh. Oh, kind of frozen. Might have a connection issue. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Do you put it? Go ahead. I'm just going to say that those conversations, either with the user groups directly, I think are so important, and also with the law enforcement agencies to understand what their struggles are, why they're not able to enforce the rules. You know, maybe they've had cutbacks in staff or equipment or support, or they need more educational materials to distribute to people. Um, I just think those kinds of creative conversations and uh, making time for those priorities is really important. So I like I like the approach that Carlton had. So I'm hoping that he can hear this or that he tunes in in a second here. But one of the things, and I, I can do some of this, um, one of the things that I want to make sure that we go over is just how the Pine Barrens is connected to Barnegat Bay. Um, and it might seem obvious to those of us that do this often, uh, but I don't, I, I think we would have a really short, big shortcoming if we didn't go over that at least a little bit in our call tonight. So um, I think Carlton's still frozen, so I'm going to do my best and hopefully when he gets back in, he can <laughs> fill in any holes that I left. Um, so the Pinelands is a, it, the Pine Barrens is a forest and the Pine Lands is the piece of paper that protects that forest. Um, but that forest is just on the surface, but beneath the surface of the land is a very big storage area of water. And so uh, you might have heard of the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer, which is one of the biggest and cleanest aquifers in this region, and especially obviously in New Jersey. And many of us south of Lakewood, Brick, and Jackson get our drinking water from the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer and obviously most of South Jersey. So um, I can pull up an image and share my screen with you in a minute uh, to show you just how vast the aquifer is. And if you look at it, the Pinelands or the Pine Barrens ecosystem pretty much sits right on top of it. And so, um, you know, so if you, if we're talking about the water cycle and how the water cycle goes in a, a you know, in a circle, there you are. <laughs> you all look fine to me. I didn't realize there was a problem. It's okay. It's okay. I don't know what happened there. Um, I just want to get your other thing off of here. Um, Great band started to uh, talk about the connection between the pines and the bay. Yep, I heard all that. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, so maybe you want to jump in. I was just, all I did was explain that the forest is sitting on top of that really um, critical aquifer. And what I'd like to do is connect how the Pine Barrens and the, the water supply um, is, you know, affects Barnegat Bay. And, and if you could just do some of that connecting the dots. Well, I mean, an estuary is such a productive um, place because it's a mix of salt and fresh water. And the fresh water in Barnegat Bay is coming from its watershed, most of which is in the Pinelands. And most of that watershed is forested. 
So the water that is coming into Barnegat Bay from the lower two thirds of its watershed, it's very clean. Whereas the water coming into the bay from the upper third, which is outside the Pinelands and includes Lakewood, which has been, you know, this, a place of very intensive development, is highly polluted. And um, that's been a big problem. Uh, you know, Barnegat Bay is a far less uh, healthy and productive estuary than it once was. And that appears to be primarily due to um, nitrogen contamination coming through Tom's River and uh, Matitacock from the northern part of the bay, as well as atmospheric deposition of nitrogen in the air from burning of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so protecting the watershed for an estuary is absolutely critical to its success. And um, Barnegat Bay is as, is as healthy as it is today because of the pinelands. And it would be a whole lot healthier if it weren't for that, you know, very intensive development of the northern third of its watershed. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that um, that I am um, so I took some time recently in, in quarantine to read the, the CCMP, which is a document that um, governs one of the organizations we work with and their work moving forward and all of us as partners within that um, with the Barnegat Bay Partnership. And one of the things that they highlight in there and one of the sections is how water supply affects the Barnegat Bay and how as we pull from the aquifer, how we pull fresh water from the aquifer, we don't, um, uh, less clean water is headed to Barnegat Bay. So if you think about pollution, pollution, unfortunately, the solution to pollution is not dilution. And I always say that because it's so relevant. Um, but it, as we pull fresh, clean water out of the supply, less fresh, clean water is headed to Barnegat Bay. And so the pollution is even more concentrated. Um, and so that's a concept that I don't think we think about all the time. Um, and so some of the, some of the, I actually talk about the aquifer and the pinelands in every single one of my um, educational presentations because it ties into stormwater because we need to refill that aquifer by um, you know allowing stormwater to land in situ where it lands and, and let it go through vegetation instead of what's happening now way too often is it's landing on a hard impervious surface and it's not refilling the aquifer so we're kind of hurting hurting the bay and the pinelands twofold we're covering it up with with impervious surface and we're depleting its supply um, and so the water cycle connects all those dots and connects all those pieces together and how um, both ecosystems play a role in both uh, being protected and being preserved. Um, and so I try really, really hard to bring in those things when we do educational programs, drinking water, because every single person needs drinking water. You may not swim in the bay, but you can't survive here without clean water. And that starts with, with, our, with the Pine Barrens. So, I just I couldn't I couldn't finish this program without going over that at least a little bit. <laughs> um, does anyone have any other questions for Carlton or any other thoughts to add? Willie, go ahead. Uh, I want to ask about pine beetles, Car Carlton's perception of them. Uh, around not too far from where I live, there's some real expanses of pines, and over by Ocean County College and um, at Reedy Creek, and there are really discouragingly large areas that have been devastated by pine beetles. The hopeful aspect of it, if you, once you start looking, is that you really can see areas that have been weakened by other sources. Their roots have been torn up by uh, uh, off-road vehicles, or, or they're too close to the road or they've been getting salt or whatever. So it, they do seem to be attacking the weaker pines, but still just the sheer magnitude of it uh, gives me the chills sometimes because because the pine barrens are out there. Um, what Do you have a feeling of, of doom or a feeling that nature will restore itself or what's, what's your take on that? 
Well, my take basically is that the solutions people come up with are worse than the disease. Um, and that uh, I think we have to, you know, live with the fact that pine beetles have actually been in the pine barrens for a long time. Not a serious scourge, historically. Occasionally they'll come and do a bit of damage and then they fall back because of uh, predators that, you know, follow the rise in population of the pine beetle. As the area warms, we're probably going to get more, though, uh, pine beetle damage and, and perhaps other similar um, uh, pests that can, um, you know, damage these areas. But the forest will recover. It can look pretty bad and um, it, it can feel depressing, but I think that, you know, solutions, whether they are chemical or mechanical, are not better than letting, let's say, essentially letting nature take its course, given what we've what we've handed it. That's my my feeling. I mean, I'm open to seeing it differently. Um, but we've seen, you know, people are who people who want to do something anyway come up with excuses. Um, and pine beetles is one of those things that occasionally is used an excuse as an excuse for forestry. Yeah. And I don't think it should be. I think you know if there's going to be Cutting of trees, it should be on its own merits, not uh, and and don't use uh, the either the possibility or the beginning of pine beetle infestation to justify cutting down trees to save other trees. Because I just don't think it's it's a legitimate approach. Um, who, who in particular feeds on pine beetles? Woodpeckers of a certain sort, or 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 what? Oh, it's a, a wasp, I believe. It's, or my, you know what? I can't remember now, Willie. But there is a a uh, insect or creature that that um, seems to keep the population down, or you know, push it back down as yeah. it rises. Yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. they were looking at a mite, if I recall correctly. Yeah. 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 Aphid or a mite, something like that. Now another sub nature subject was um, uh, John McPhee's treatment of fire in the pines. And he makes one statement there that really surprised me that he that was that 1% uh, of fires are sparked by lightning. And he wrote that in 1967. Do you happen to know if that's the current perception of, of bot botanists and ecologists that, that very small percentage of lightning strikes? Uh, yeah, that's what I've always been told by the Forest Fire Service, that in a typical year, there might be as many as 2,000 fires in forested areas, um, but that a tiny, tiny percentage, like 1%, are um, due to lightning. The vast majority, virtually all of them, are people, you know. So a, a campfire, um, that kind of thing, or in some cases, you know, on purpose. So what's interesting about that is that I, I've also heard that if it weren't for fire, the pine looks, would gradually become an oak forest or move in that direction of, of a de deciduous tree forest. Well, that's so so it, it, if you put those two together, it's almost as if to sustain the pines, we are dependent on, on miscreants <laughs> lighting the woods on fire. Right, because in a natural, in a, in a um, pre-European settlement time, the rare lightning caused fire would burn a lot. The fires would be big, but now we put fires out. Okay. And a big fire around here is 10,000, 14,000 acres. Um, which isn't really that big. So in order to uh, reproduce the natural fire regime that um, in which the Pine Barrens evolved, um, there does have to be human intervention, given that we're going to put fires out in order to, to protect people and their property. And, and so one of the one of the um, issues that we have advocated on for many, many years is for the state to adopt a more aggressive prescribed or intentional fire system 
don't rely, don't rely on people with cigarettes. That's a bad mistake because the fires will be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but if you do more prescribed burning and you burn larger areas at hotter temperatures, um, you can better replicate the natural fire cycle. And, uh, and it's, it's good for the Pine Barrens Forest when you do that. But it's, a, you know, it's hard for state agencies to do those projects because they worry about either public misperception or an accident happening. And so they do relatively a relatively small amount of prescribed burning compared to the size of the resource. And they burn in a very narrow time window in conditions that don't allow the fire to get very hot. But occasionally, um, the Forest Fire Service here has experimented with uh, larger fires. And one of them they did in conjunction with the New Jersey Conservation Foundation at the Franklin Parker Preserve. Uh, larger and hotter fires, and they've been very successful. But, you know, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of energy, a lot of focus, and, you know, even after a successful project, sometimes the agency loses its focus and devotes its energies elsewhere. So it's been difficult to get a consistent regime of, of fires that can replicate that natural cycle. My world was rocked because I grew up in, you know, born in 1992, Smokey the Bear was in, you know, just, I don't know, is it called propaganda? I mean, Smokey the Bear is what I saw, you know, forest fires are bad. Ironically, it, Smokey the Bear began here in New Jersey where fires are in fact important and natural and essential. And uh, it took me a little while to catch on to that whole phenomenon. And uh, a botanist who is a good friend of our organization uh, was explaining to me that uh, the seeds of those rare plants can't actually get down into the soil because not enough of the fuel is burning off. Um, and so it's, it's so, so essential. And so when I started to learn about that, that now I now, I, I don't even know how to explain that to people because the perception is so, like, it's just such a public, everyone's so confused. It's like, we want forest fires, but we don't want them in certain places, not certain times a year. And so it's just, it's one of those management issues. I can't even imagine what you go through to try and communicate that with your stakeholders and your, and your groups. Whenever there's a big fire, we get phone calls from um, at least one reporter, and there's still a few left out there in the world. Um, saying, so, you know, uh, you must be pretty upset about this fire that destroyed so many acres of forest. And, and you know, when you, when you look at, when you read national news about forest fires, they, they confuse the destruction of human places with the idea that it destroys a forest. Yeah. Fire doesn't destroy forests. Yeah. It renews them. It may destroy, it may kill individual trees, um, but it isn't, it isn't a, a bad thing for nature in general. Now, of course, you know, you can have a problem where you've done such hard work to suppress fire over so many years that by the time the fire does come, there's so much fuel for it that you get a really big, really broadcast fire. Or a, a, a case like happened in Australia recently, right, where it appears that really climate change has caused vast, vast fires. At that point, it becomes a problem because you have populations of wildlife, for example, that in a typical fire regime, they can escape. They can go underground or they can run away. But if it's big enough, they can't. And, and so that's a, you know, that is part of a climate change conversation, but uh, in some places, and in our case, it's part of a, a management conversation that we have to do enough burning to prevent the really cataclysmic fire. Right. I think, um, I, you know, it. we heard that about uh, Sandy as well, Superstorm Sandy. A lot of people ask us all the time, how was Barnegat Bay impacted by Superstorm Sandy? And certainly climate change is creating more and more uh, storms and stronger at that. Uh, but one of the things I try to remind people is that Superstorm Sandy was detrimental for us, that we live here at the shore and our, our infrastructure. But the bay 
had a whole different response to that. And in some cases, there was this um, renewed water and, and space, you know, water came in and just flushed uh, things out. So it was kind of interesting, you know, people's perception of large um, natural disasters and so on. Um, but really quick, you mentioned climate change twice now. So I just want to bring it back around because I think it's important to not leave again this program without talking about climate change. So Highland uh, pine beetle uh, possibly increasing in population due to warmer temperatures and um, a different fire um, outcomes. So if there's anything else related to climate change and how the pinelands will be affected by those changing temperatures. Yeah, there are. I mean, I, there appear to be a number of impacts. One of them that is, again, perhaps more a matter of, of what people want is that um, in the pine barrens, we have two wonderful native crops, cranberries and blueberries. And uh, warming climate is having uh, a pretty serious effect on those crops. And um, I, I'm friends with one cranberry farmer uh, who really believes that cranberry farming may not survive in New Jersey too much longer because we don't have the same cold winters we used to. And it changes how the, the berries develop in the course of the year. So farmers are trying to change the varieties that they're growing, um, but that's a huge investment. It's a long-term investment, and it's one that the smaller growers, in many cases, really can't pull off. So in addition to a consolidation of the industry into you know, just a few of the, the bigger farms, um, you also have a real, uh, you know, real detriment to the crop. Um, and uh, again, like with the forest itself, more pests, more evolving pests um, that they have to try to deal with. So there are some crops that could be seriously affected and they're kind of part of our culture. You know, we love those aspects of the Pine Barrens. Um, there's also sea level rise, right? That's having an impact uh, around uh, the shore, but it has an impact going upstream. It, you know, the head of, the head of tide um, goes upstream and it changes um, the ecology of those areas. There may not be places that nature can retreat to as water rises and marshes, for example, in the, if it weren't for us being around, they would simply move over time, <laughs> They'll move inland. But we're living there now and we weren't gonna let that happen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, um, you're gonna see effects from sea level rise, long-term effects on the aquifers as salt water, the, the, line, the salt water line underground moves farther and farther inland. Mm -hmm. um, that also is gonna have an impact on uh, both on people and on, on the natural cycles. Those are some of the things that are gonna happen. And other things, of course, we don't know yet because we're not, we're not all knowing. Well, it's important to know uh, what we can do to affect change in those things. So we obviously we talked about writing uh, Sweeney to try and help get the commission seated so that we have strong advocates for the Pine Barrens. And there are the things that Save Barnegat Bay talks about all the time to do with stormwater and uh, supporting our local fishing industry and, and so many other their calls to action are really numerous, but we have a perfect Perfect way to wrap up our program tonight from Willie is asking us, um, how can someone join the Pinelands Preservation Alliance? And then if you can highlight any other calls to action that a regular person can do in their everyday behavior change to help. Well, joining the Pinelands Preservation Alliance is very easy. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, a charity like say Barnegat Bay. So we depend on the generosity of others to be able to do the work we do. And uh, just going to our website at pinelandsalliance.org is a great way to become a member online. Um, and you can get involved, um, whether you become a member or not, you can get involved as a volunteer. So that, that includes doing things like um, writing to Senator Sweeney and other political powers to tell them to do the right thing by the Pinelands and Barnegat Bay. Um, it can also mean getting involved in stewardship projects. We do a lot of stewardship work. 
um, on preserved lands to try to protect areas from being harmed and restore areas that have been harmed. And that's done um, with volunteers. Um, and uh, that's a, you know, I think that's a really important function as well. Um, uh, you know, as far as how we live, uh, I, I do think probably the most important thing that those of us who live in this region can do is take care of our own you know, houses and apartments and properties where we live and try to be sure that uh, stormwater isn't just running off of our roofs into the street and into the gutter and ultimately carrying, you know, all those pollutants straight into the bay or into the streams that feed the bay. Um, but try to try to have uh, rain barrels and rain gardens and um, try to make sure that our, our municipal governments are doing a good job with stormwater. And um, we have information about that on our website. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you guys do too at this point. It's been a huge priority for St. Barnica Bay and you guys have been real real leaders in that field. Um, so, you know, I think that's probably the single most important thing we can do. I don't know, do you, do you feel the same way? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think that a lot of those things that you covered are are the heavy hitters for sure. But I just want to make sure that everyone hears the idea that it doesn't have to be those really big things either. Um, you know, maybe like I live in a, an apartment, I live in 750 square feet, and I can't really have a garden uh, reasonably here at my home. So I try to do the smaller things in my everyday life. Like I try to reduce my consumption of plastic. I try to, um, you know, buy as locally as I can. Uh, you know, being conscious about the things that we purchase, like our light bulbs and our vehicles and driving less and all those little things that add up to, um, you know, might not, you know, those things might contribute less to atmospheric nitrogen, for instance, uh, that will maybe over a collection of people doing those things will reduce uh, overall um, impact on our, our global ecosystem and then obviously our local ecosystem. So it doesn't have to be the really big things. Um, and finally, I, I always finish my, my educational presentations with the idea that if you can't do anything, if you have no means to make any change whatsoever, uh, you can use your voice and you can share something that you've learned with someone else, be it sharing this program, this link, uh, sharing this with your friends and family or neighbors, and especially sharing it with the people that you might think um, may not be prepared to listen. Uh, having a conversation, I think that's been a theme of our program tonight, having conversations with people that um, don't think like us or don't speak like us or don't um, don't initially come off like they care, they probably do, in fact, um, and that uh, if we can come to a space of community and um, communal uh, conversation, then we might actually get somewhere and find out that you two groups of people really do care about the thing. And um, it's not that there's two different sides. It's just different priorities and that's okay. Um, so uh, if you leave this presentation, share one thing with someone else, I think that's that's pretty great in itself. And that doesn't require any money and very little time. So, um, Absolutely. so yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> I think this is a fantastic program, Carlton. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and your passion. I think the, uh, the thought, thought leadership from John McPhee you know, really lighting the, the spark, you know, to get things done on the legislative level. Um, just wonderful to see it continue, the conversation continue. I'd like to see us share this video recording maybe with a email out to our supporters. So if they missed it, they can maybe take a, an hour, get a cup of coffee and listen in, even though they couldn't be with us tonight. And they can learn a lot really about the pines and the connection to the bay and how important those Pinelands Commission's appointments are. So thank you very much, Carlton, uh, for being with us tonight and sharing all that. Thanks for inviting me to participate. It's great to see you all. Yeah, it's nice to see each other, right? <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And for those of you who stuck with us here in Zoom and on Facebook, um, we're thrilled to have you always. Thank you so much. And uh, um, one more thing, December. December. Yes. So 
so we have been reading books every month since April um, through COVID. And you can find all the past books that we read on um, the uh, Goodreads website, which I can link here below, um, the Goodreads uh, Barnegat Bay Book Club. It's got all the books we've past read. And then on our YouTube, you can find all of the programs that we had so far from all the amazing authors and speakers throughout the um, past uh, for, you know, several months. Uh, but in December, with everything going on at the end of the month with holidays and, and just everything, uh, we are going to attempt to host a program for uh, the book that we read called The Bayman, which if you haven't read The Bayman, I have to say it's one of my favorites. Um, it was of all the books and it's just, there's kind of, there's some magic, there's some tension, there's just truth and honesty and story involved in how um, so much has evolved. Um, I appreciated that story a lot. And so what we'd like to do is host our winter solstice event um, and have uh, two gentlemen that play uh, at Albert Hall. I think they both did play at Albert Hall when it was open. Uh, to share some of their musical culture with us that is from the Pine Barrens um, and uh, just share that Bayman, Piney music and, and food and culture online as best as we can. So please look out for that event as we post more information about that on our social media sites and our email communications. So we're not reading a book again in December. Instead, you have more time to read the Bayman if you haven't already. Um, it's a fantastic book. And I think Down the Shore Publishing published that book as well. So by buying the book, you're supporting a local publisher. And it's that time of year. So if you're buying gifts, you should support local publishers, local seafood growers, local honeybee keepers. And um, yeah, definitely think about those local groups in the holiday season when you're buying gifts. Um, so I will post that link below really quick so that you can find all that stuff. So hopefully we're going to get these bluegrass artists to join us, celebrate a little bit of culture and music. You can pour your own cocktail at home and digitally join us. It's not a fundraiser. It's just an opportunity to get together and celebrate uh, the seasons. Um, we're looking at doing it on the winter solstice, but we still have to get the commitments from the musicians in. So we'll share the details as they become available. Yeah. Um, I'm just putting the last link here so that you can see all the books we've read and keep in touch with books that we're reading in the future and hopefully foster some discussions. And we're always open to suggestions for books if people know of a good book about the area of the environment that we haven't uh, chosen yet. So. Yes, please send them to me if you have them. I keep a running list. So, um, and cookbooks too. We're looking for recipes and uh, local seafood recipes and things. So keep those things in mind. Um, all right. I think that's everything. Um, thank you again for everyone being here tonight and um, we will see you next month. Bye.